Chronostratigraphic diagrams or chronostrat diagrams are key tools for demonstrating the geological evolution as implied by cross sections or seismic profiles. They show the geological history, but they also allow us to assess the stratigraphic correlation to identify the difference between eroded areas and areas where particular strata were not deposited, and they're particularly useful in demonstrating a tectonic history. In fact, they're the key to interpreting seismic stratigraphy. In this presentation, we're going to look at three idealized examples. They're all based on profiles. So here's example one, which is a fold banked over by younger strata. So how do we construct the chronostratigraphic diagram for this cross section? So we start off with a frame and what a chronostrat diagram does is it plots the horizontal distance over which particular horizons occur and it plots these horizons in their relative geological age and that age becomes the vertical axis on the diagram. And we have young at the top and old at the bottom. Now, when interpreting a section like this, it's always easier to work back in time. So we're going to start with the youngest strata and work systematically back down through the diagram, plotting each horizon in the reverse order to which it was deposited. So here's the first horizon, and we assume that it was deposited in an instant in time. So it plots as a single age on the diagram, therefore it's a horizontal line on the chronostrat diagram. It represents a single age. OK, let's keep going. There's the next oldest and the next oldest. Now, as we plot this one, you'll notice that as we trace it on the cross section at the top, the horizon is not found on the crest of the fold. It banks against the fold. So on the chronostrat diagram, there's a gap in the middle of it where the horizon was not deposited. Let's go down again and we can see the same motif for the underlying horizon and the one under this. So all of these three that we've just plotted have a missing segment to their extent across the crest of the fold. But as we continue down, the rocks within the fold itself can be found right across the profile, so they stretch across the entire chronostrat diagram. This one here would as well. In fact, on the diagram where the arrows are, there are two places where that horizon does not continue, and that's shown with a dashed line. It's not a geological termination, it's just simply how far we've extended our interpretation to depth. Likewise, this horizon here and the one in the core of the fold. So there is the basic Kronstrat diagram showing the extent of the horizons and their relative order in geological time. Now let's interpret it. The first thing we can do is with these half arrows show how these horizons that we've just identified terminate towards the fold. They onlap the fold limb and we show that with these half arrows on the Kronstrat diagram. The area that we've now just picked out there that lies between those arrowheads with no rocks represents an area of non-deposition. So on the cross section and within that geological period, there is no deposition. Right, well that's example one. Let's move to our next example. Here we go, we're going to contrast the example we've just looked at, which is now on the left of the screen, with one which we'll explore, and that's shown on the right, which shows simply a fold planed off and then buried. So again, we'll draw the chronostrat diagram for this. We'll plot horizontal distance against relative age, old at the bottom, young at the top, and again, we'll work back through time, starting with the youngest and working progressively to older rocks. So there is the one at the top, the next oldest, and the next oldest, and the next oldest, and the next oldest, and the next oldest. So all those are found right across the diagram, so they are shown as continuous lines on the chronostrat diagram. There are no missing rocks, there's no non-deposition. However, beneath that unconformity, we can see that the rocks within the fold terminate against the unconformity. So they don't extend all the way across the diagram. And let's plot these in now, systematically working to deeper rocks. So we're going to move into the core of the antiform. Again, the deeper parts, which represent the extreme parts of the chronostrat diagram, both left and right, are not shown on the cross section. That's not because they don't exist in geology. It's because the diagram is terminated downwards. The real cross section is terminated downwards. And so forth. Finally, in the core of the fold, the oldest rocks continue across the crest of the fold 
so they're shown in the middle of the Kronstadt diagram. So that layer was originally continuous. So remember, on the Kronostat diagram, those dashed parts represent areas that are not shown on the cross-section. That's not to say they don't really exist in the subsurface. They're just not illustrated. Right, again, let's interpret. So in this case, the beds that are shown in blue, which form the fold, are truncated by the unconformity. And these are shown by these sort of upside-down half arrows on the Kronostat diagram. So this area in here on the Kronostat diagram has been eroded away. Originally, those rocks would have presumably continued to join up across the fold, but they've been planed off by the erosion represented by the unconformity. Let's just move it over to the side. The period of time after the erosion may have been one of non-deposition before the rocks above the unconformity could get deposited. So we can contrast the stratigraphic motif for these two fold structures and their chronostratigraphic representation. They make different implications for the continuity and stratigraphic record in there. OK, the third and final example is a half graben that we can see in our cross section up there. We've got rocks that have been tilted, a half graben that's filled with sediment, and the whole lot is banked over. The wiggly lines represent erosional unconformities on the fault blocks. So again, let's plot this on the chronostrat diagram. Again, horizontal distance versus geological age, old going up to young, and we'll work back in time. So there's the youngest rocks at the top of the diagram, move down and down. So we've got those three green horizons that we attract right across the diagram. But let's keep going down in those greens, and we can see that this particular horizon is restricted to the half graben, and even more so for the slightly older one that lies underneath. Let's keep going down. So now we go into some brown and orange units. The first brown one there is tilted, but it doesn't matter. We plot it, it's an instant in time. So on the chronostrat diagram, plots horizontally. It's an instant in geological time, and it has that extent. And similarly with the orange horizon. Again, let's keep going down. So now we're going to go into the uh, blue and purple units, and they plot like this, like this, and like this, simply referring the lengths that we see in the diagram at the top, the cross section, onto the chronostrat diagram, they represent an instant in time. So even though they're tilted on the cross section, they plot horizontally in the chronostrat diagram because we're plotting their relative geological age. OK, let's interpret. And the two green horizons that have limited extent onlap the tilted brown strata and the fault plane. So to the left of this, towards the left-hand fault block, there was non-deposition beyond the point of onlap. Against the fault scarp, there was onlap onto the fault scarp, therefore at the geological time that those strata were deposited, further to the right, they weren't deposited. There was non-deposition. OK, let's keep going down. So these strata that are older than the green ones, if you look at the cross-section, they're truncated by that wiggly unconformity. Therefore, on the chronostrat diagram, they don't continue across, and the truncations are shown by these upside-down half arrows. This little one in the middle, the slightly orangey one, actually, if you look carefully, onlaps the light blue horizon. So it's shown by a correct way up half arrow. OK, so let's just complete the interpretation of the unconformity. There it goes in chronostrat space, showing the brown and blue horizons and purple horizon truncated by the unconformity. They would have existed further to the left if they'd been eroded away. In contrast, the orange horizon never existed to the left because it onlaps the blue horizon. OK, what about the right-hand side of those? Well, the brown and orange horizons onlap the fault plane. As we go further down, though, the two blues and purple horizons are truncated and offset by the fault plane. I show these relationships as little blobs. OK, so the fault continued down like this. Right, to complete this interpretation now, we're going to turn our attention to the right-hand side of the cross-section, where we can see the purple and dark blue horizons occurring in the fault block on the fault wall side of the fault, truncated by another unconformity up here. So let's add this 
on the Chronostrat diagram, and you can see the extent of the dark blue and purple horizons down there in the right-hand corner of the Chronostrat diagram. They're truncated by the unconformity, so we show those with the upside-down half arrows, and we can draw on the unconformity surface there and show that they've been eroded. So originally, purple and blue continued across the diagram, but they didn't continue all the way because they've been offset by the fault. So let's put the fault on now on this side. And the gap between the fault on the right-hand side and the left-hand side on the chronostrat diagram is something called fault loss. The purple and blue horizons have been pulled apart by faulting, leaving a gap in their horizontal extent. This is fault loss. And it continues within the orange and brown because those have also been faulted a little bit. They're rotated in the fault block, so they are the Sinrift deposit. So fault loss and erosion is distinct from non-deposition. So that's our completed chronostrat diagram. What we can do now is interpret it in terms of tectonic mega sequences. The purple and two blue horizons are pre-kinematic. So their internal character would show no changes as you approach the fault because they were deposited before the fault was there. In contrast, the synkinematic strata, which are constrained to lie within the half graben, were deposited during faulting. They show some of the fault slip and some of the rotation associated with faulting. And presumably their internal character would betray their proximity to the fault, which was active as they were being deposited. The post-kinematic strata, which fill in the residual topography in the half graben and then bury everything as well, well, the lower parts of that, which are contained within the half graben itself, would presumably show internal character changes as you approach the uh, on-lap, not only onto the fault, but also towards the non-deposition surface. But then the younger parts of the post-kinematic strata, which bury everything in sight, presumably would show no particular relationships to the underlying fault structures, which they seal. So although the structure on the top is actually fairly straightforward, the chronostratigraphic representation and the geological history that you can tell from it is actually fairly complicated. The chronostrat diagram here is a critical tool for describing that geological history. So there we are, a brief introduction to chronostratigraphic diagrams. To emphasise, they show the geological history. They show how different stratigraphic sections can be correlated. We can explore the relationship between eroded and non-deposited parts of successions, and we can deduce the tectonic history. On these diagrams, we've just been using simple cartoon cross-sections, but chronostrat diagrams are fundamental to displaying understanding of seismic stratigraphy when we come to look at seismic profiles.